Hello, everybody. So let's start today in Spain, in Barcelona. And how can we build cities around data sovereignty? And this is going to be the topic of this talk. And what is the role of cities today in moments where we are facing major crises uh, from widening inequalities, to climate change, to migration, to geopolitical and financial instability, job stagnation and wage depression, in a moment where nation states are really not giving structural answers to these global problems, and many talk about the crisis of legitimacy of the liberal world order. Of course, one response we see is the rise of more nationalism and right-wing populists taking power all over the world. But this is not the only answer. If we look at our techno-economic change, we are facing a big shift to the fourth industrial revolution. So we see trends like artificial intelligence, robotization, the internet of things, and automation. Automation of manufacturing, of logistics, of intensive labor industries that are going to really disrupt the government, our business, our society. With applications such as driverless cars, precision agriculture, machine learning in healthcare, or artificial intelligence in cybersecurity. So all these trends are going to be accelerated by the rise of big tech, and are we going to see robotization and big tech challenges, for instance, creation of monopoly power or creation of mass unemployment, the need for new taxes, trade regulation? How are we going to face this big shift? If we look at the power of the big tech companies today, they are a new market power. And how to tame the big tech has become one of the fundamental political questions of our time. So these are the largest firms by market capitalization are the tech giants today. And they have a combined market value of around 3 trillion US dollars, and 1 trillion is offshore. So 80% of all corporate wealth is concentrated in 10% of the firms, and this value goes directly into share buybacks or payment of dividends, and it doesn't really get to all of us, to the ordinary citizens that are not really better off. What are these companies extracting? What these companies are extracting in the digital economy, it's us, it's our data. And of course, these are companies that in the first place received a lot of government funding. So data is the raw material of the digital economy and it fuels artificial intelligence, what Tim Cook has called the data industrial complex. And this is a sentence from Angela Merkel in Davos last year, and she says, who wants the data will decide at the end whether democracy, a participatory social model, and economic prosperity can be combined. So basically, this is about democracy and the future of our society. Some economists talk about data extractivism as the fundamental economic model of the digital economy, which is a rent-extracting economy. And Shoshana Zubov from Harvard Business School talk about surveillance capitalism. What she means is behavioral surplus, which is extracted, and the data of social behavior that is extracted uh, by, by the population. Another issue that we have to face is the question of when artificial intelligence is becoming the fundamental technology of our time, and machine learning in particular, where governments and big companies are investing the, the next generation industrial strategy, lots of billions into AI, what are the social, ethical, and geopolitical implications of artificial intelligence? And the majority of experts agree that we want to end with black box algorithms in government. So we want to make algorithms public and we want to make data transaction more transparent. So this is the uh, big picture. What is the role of cities here? What can cities do? And I would argue that we have, because we have a, a crisis of trust, cities is the right place to rethink alternatives. We can make cities a democratic laboratory for sustainable and more egalitarian alternatives. And cities can create public value, as I argue in my uh, essay with Eugenie Morris of Rethinking the Smart City. And Saskia Sassen talk about the city as one of the few places where those without power get to make a history. So this is our mayor, she's the mayor of Barcelona, Ada Colau, and she was elected into power campaigning from a citizen platform. Uh, she used to be the leader for the right to housing and the right to the city uh, movement in Barcelona, and when she got into the government, she called for a democratic revolution. 
So I used to be, I'm Italian, I'm not Catalan, I used to be in London, and she called me and she says, can you come to Barcelona and rethink the smart city from the bottom up, putting technology and data at the service of our people? And I said, this is a fantastic challenge. And I went to Barcelona, and for the last three years, we've been working with a team of civic technologists, hackers, cryptographers, and talented people inside the government to make this happen, to align the technology with the democratic agenda of our mayor. So the first thing we've done is to use collective intelligence for democracy. So instead of implementing an agenda from the top down, technology first, we implemented this, a people first agenda. And we have a platform, it's called Decid in Barcelona, and we engage in a large scale participatory democracy uh, process, which is a hybrid on offline democracy and online democracy. So today, 70% of the actions that are the government plan of Barcelona came directly from citizens. Citizens were able to propose ideas, to deliberate, to vote on things, and we have a participatory budgeting uh, uh, experiments that is really devolving more power to the citizens. 400,000 citizens participated to create the action plan, and now we are running 20 different participatory processes in parallel. So what it takes to redefine the smart city to ensure that it serves its citizens? As I said before, we don't start from the technology, sensor network, connectivity, 5G, blockchain. We start from the real challenges that cities face. Affordable housing, healthcare for all, sustainable mobility, the energy transition, public spaces, the fight to climate change. These are the things that our citizens care about. And only after we ask, how can technology and data help us to solve those challenges. For instance, Barcelona is now putting forward an experiment for uh, energy, uh, renewable energy supplier. So it's a municipal company that is providing energy to all municipal buildings, clean energy, solar energy, and then to allow for an energy transition with thousands of um, private houses that can benefit from the generation of renewable energy. We have another project, maybe you've heard about, is the Barcelona Superblock. What we have done to fight climate change and improve the air quality of the city is to create 16 districts of the cities that are cut off to traffic. In that way, together with urbanists, designers, citizens themselves, we, we were able to grow more uh, green space and to take back 60% of the streets that before were, um, where cars were um, passing. So a fundamental part of this rethinking the smart city is the question of data. And I think this question here is going to be a very important political question for the future. Will data be controlled by big business and the state or by citizens themselves? And in our thinking, data is a bit like energy, is a bit like transportation, is a new public infrastructure. It's like the air we breathe. And we believe data can be considered a public good, a public infrastructure, and we can devolve the control of data to citizens themselves. And citizens can be the one that decide what data they want to keep private, what data they want to share, with whom and on what terms. So we put forward a new deal on data, a strategy that has ethics, security and privacy by design baked into the technology that we create and we develop. And also we make sure that cities can be the custodians of the new digital rights of citizens. And we also have processes in place to assess like automated decision making and the question of artificial intelligence. So how can we make sure that there is accountability and transparency in the algorithms? Maybe we should make algorithm public and make sure that this can be inspected by a wider community. We also created some ethical digital standards. This is a project of digitalization of the entire city of Barcelona. And one thing we've, we did was, first of all, to migrate a lot of the services to open source and free software. 80% of our IT investment today, it's done in open source and open standards interoperability so that we can make sure that we take all the profit of IT infrastructure. And then we attack one main thing, which is procurement. So I know it's not very sexy, 
but procurement is at the core of what, what government do. We spend citizen money to improve public services and to invest in future infrastructure. So what we've done is we put clauses in public procurement contract that mandate data sovereignty. What it means is that providers uh, that win the bids have to transfer to the city hall data in machine readable format and this become in the public domain. It becomes a public good, a common good. And of course you can also bake into the contracts things like open standards, interoperability, ethics and security by design so that we make sure that we have a strategy that really benefits the citizens. Of course, with data you can do a lot of other things, open data, open budget, so that you create more transparency, you make government more transparent and collaborative, and also fight corruption. For this fighting corruption, we create an infrastructure which is encrypted, it has cryptography, it allows for anonymity, it's like based on Tor, so it's like Wikileaks, it integrates with the city infrastructure, so everybody, public officials, but also citizens, can denounce cases of corruption. We have a IoT, Internet of Things, and data analytic platform that the city controls so that we can better uh, manage public services like energy monitoring, noise monitoring, water metering, we can see parking spots, we can do better garbage collection, and then we are able to do machine learning and data analytics on top of this data. And those platforms are all open source. Many cities are reusing them from Dubai to Helsinki all around the world because it's open standards. We have also created the mayor office for data analytics with the intent to open the algorithmic black box but also create capacity in government. There are around 30 to 40 people now with new skills, with machine learning capabilities, data scientists that are working to create good services and good application and open up the data to the startups, the innovators, the SMEs that can help us building new services for the city of Barcelona. We also went a little bit far and we are now experimenting a project which is using blockchain or distributed ledger with a cryptography, a new cryptographic layer on top to give back data sovereignty to citizens. So we are building privacy uh, enhancing, decentralized, rights preserving infrastructure to give control to the people. Because we don't think that the data should be controlled by governments or by big companies, but by citizens themselves. So that they can start seeing what kind of data I keep private it, what data I want to share, for what purpose, and with whom. And so we are thinking with uh, lawyers also and cryptographers, this is a big project with 14 partners around Europe, what are the new data commons? How can we enable social and community rights to data? And now we are running two pilots in Barcelona. One, it links to our uh, democracy platform, the city in Barcelona, so you can sign secure petitions, citizens, when they engage online uh, in a democratic participation process, they can control their data so that we don't have data manipulations like the one we're seeing with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, for instance. And then we have an IoT pilot, which is an Internet of Things pilot, where people are putting sensors in their home, uh, like Arduino boxes to measure air quality, noise pollution, and all kinds of different um, data streams. And then we are enabled citizens to basically share those data in an encrypted way, and then set licenses through smart contracts so that they can control the data. So this is our vision of a data as a public infrastructure, a city data commons that can be governed by cities, but in particular by citizens, and then the data can be opened up, of course in a regulated way, with privacy and security by design as the GDPR mandate, can be opened up to local industry, to startup, to SMEs, but also to cooperatives and to citizens themselves that can use this data to build data intensive, artificial intelligence-driven services that will change transportation, healthcare, education in the future. So we need to rethink how we govern data in a way that it will be serving the public good and the general interest. And this is a way to do it. And of course, you can think about how this scales to a national or even a European level. Can this become a new data fund, a new European data infrastructure that can be governed in that specific way and can allow our our industry to take back um, democratic control but also to be more competitive. 
So we have created uh, to when we unleash the power of data and when we unleash the power of the immaterial and digital infrastructure of the city, then we can have mission-oriented innovation in cities. And we have created an urban iLab, which basically brings together the city with companies, corporates, startups, and all the city ecosystem to solve problems that the city has. So now we're working on women in tech, mobility, affordable housing, the circular economy, and we are using data of the city and the companies are helping us to really tackle the problems that we have. And there is a, a, a data city challenge that really uses data to do that. This can also enable a different sharing economy. As you know, many cities have been struggling with Airbnb or Uber, asking how can we regulate these data platforms? I mean, they are creating a gig economy where they lower the, the kind of uh, standards of labor, but also creating problems for cities about the price of rent, for instance, in the case of Airbnb, or in the case of Uber, they take up the market and it's not very competitive. So for whom is the sharing economy? Well, of course, cities are coming together to regulate the sharing economy. We actually are gonna host a meeting in Barcelona this month where uh, together with New York and Berlin, we are thinking about how to regulate together, but also we can provide alternatives. Now we are investing in uh, new platform cooperatives, in uh, digital social innovation. This is a European project where the European Commission has put around 60 million, is led by Nesta in the UK, and we are expecting experimenting with new cooperative model of service provision, like a Uber which can be owned by the workers, which has good environmental um, workers and digital uh, standards for citizens. And finally, we can also see uh, new projects in the circular economy, Barcelona as a maker district, where we are unleashing the power of the maker community and rethinking future urban manufacturing and the circular economy, or experimenting with cryptocurrency, for instance, for basic income. This is a new scheme that we are uh, piloting now in Barcelona, where we have a digital currency and a cryptocurrency uh, to um, provide basic income to thousands of people in the city. And of course, if we don't enable the population to get access to digital skills and to learn to rethink the future of jobs in an age of automation, we're going to have problems. So that's why we're creating uh, public fab labs or maker spaces where we teach kids about um, you know, uh, digital fabrication and programming and the new digital skills. And we are putting these new skills and new methodology of learning by doing in the curriculum of all schools in Catalonia. So cities, of course, cannot do all these things alone. We need a network of cities that can replicate these policies, that can join to create new regulation, new projects, and can enable future experiments to thrive. So Barcelona is leading the fearless cities movement, is a network of cities that can make a difference. Last year we hosted the first big summit with 140 cities from all around the world, uh, 14 countries, five continents, and it's a big movement that is trying to feminize politics, give answers to migration, refugees, uh, rethinking the, the fight against climate change, but also putting data and technology in the hands of people to solve these problems and create future alternatives. And finally, I'm really done. What are the alternatives about digital supremacy world that we see where only uh, the US and China, the big giants, are competing? Where the alternative is about democratizing data ownership and democratizing artificial intelligence that we can use as a public global good. And to reclaim digital sovereignty, starting from the bottom up with cities, giving more power to the citizen, but also in Europe, we must challenge the current narrative dominated by Silicon Valley's sleek surveillance capitalism on one side, or dystopian models based on unlimited data collection, such as China's social credit system. A new deal on data and artificial intelligence based on a rights-based, people-centric framework which does not exploit personal data to pay for critical infrastructure is long overdue. And I would argue this is about democracy and cities can lead the way and Barcelona can lead the way to make this happen. Thank you very much.